Hi, my name is David and I'm an archaeologist at Queen's University, Belfast. But following the coronavirus outbreak and lockdown, with the cancellations of all face-to-face -face lectures, talks and conferences, I'm now working from home. What follows is based on a talk I had been scheduled to present to the Ulster Archaeology Society with the title People, Pots and Pointy Things, a reassessment of Irish Bronze Age material culture. Material culture is mainly about artefacts, things made by people such as pottery and metalwork, but I've included human remains because bioarchaeology can tell us a great deal about past human behaviour. In the first of what has become a series of short talks, I briefly reflect on how late prehistory came to be understood. Much of prehistory, as the name suggests, went unrecorded. There was no literate indigenous individual to say, hold on, that sounds interesting. I'll just make a note of that for posterity. However, with the arrival of literate colonizers came protohistory, the story of a subjugated society as told by the victors. Not surprisingly, this was not always as illuminating as it might have been. Conquerors mainly record their own heroic deeds, but details of the military lords they had defeated and the barbaric practices of the attendant religious leaders could also be of interest to the audience. Perhaps understandably, though, they tended to focus on the local warrior elite. Not dwelling for too long on any occasional defeats at the hands of these noble barbarians, but rather on their inevitable, if hard fought, victories. Royer's painting of Verin Guttrinex throwing down his sword at the feet of Julius Caesar, in exchange for the lives of his companions, bears little resemblance to Roman accounts of these events, and things did not generally end well for captured rebels. While the Romans may have occasionally harboured a grudging respect for their enemies, the best goal was, after all, the role of women from this period is poorly understood. For Roman historians, Bodicea or Boudicca was a rising warrior queen. But she would come to be depicted primarily as an avenging mother. And the literal translation to the names given to the main female characters in the Asterix series is somewhat less than flattering. The Romans in Gaul were well aware of the islands off to the west, with their familiar mix of druids and warrior elites who frequently provided sort to their uh, support to their continental cousins and were duly rewarded with the recipe for tea. The Romans also knew of Ireland, a land of perpetual winter which they dismissed as barely habitable. But Ptolemy had shown that it lay even further to the west, as we can see from a map produced for the Society of Antiquities of London in 1793. The vacuum left here by classical authors was filled with pseudo-history, based on little more than the imaginations of those who composed it. At its core were figures such as the fierce boy warrior Cahulan, an Irish Achilles, and Maeve, Queen of Connaught. During the 19th century, a growing interest in national origins saw Irish antiquarians fuse protohistory and pseudohistory to produce works such as Henry O'Brien's Phoenician Ireland in 1833. The following year, O'Brien published his prize winning essay, The Round Towers of Ireland, or Mysteries of Freemasonry, Sabism, and of Buddhism for the first time unveiled, an even more fanciful account of Ireland's pre -history. Charles Smith's The Costumes of, Ireland, of the Original Habitants of the British Isles, published in 1855, depicted characters from Britain and Ireland's late prehistoric period in the garb 
and trappings de uh, described by classical authors such as Scrabo and Pliny the Smith was clearly aware of the prehistoric artefacts held by bodies such as the Antiquaries of London and made liberal use of these to deck out his models. The head on the spear held by this ancient Briton is in fact a middle Bronze Age short sword. The weapon Smith was probably trying to emulate was a weighted Roman pilum. Smith was also intrigued by the religious practices of these ancients, again based on little more than a few lines by Roman authors. The same scant sources continue to inform those who gather at sites such as Stonehenge to celebrate the summer solstice. It's not clear what part the minky plays in all of this. Modern archaeologists, on the other hand, aspire to be strictly evidence-based. Not for us filling in the gaps with half-baked tales and legends. So, when it comes to warrior elites, we look for solid, irrefutable evidence of the use of weapons of war, and field archaeology is a good place to start. Field archaeology might be defined as the recovery and analysis of material culture through survey and excavation. This tranquil field in northern Germany, through which a river gently flows, provides a relaxing setting for family activities such as fishing and canoeing. But you would definitely not have wanted your family there on a winter's day 3,000 odd years ago. Based on the evidence produced by excavation, Vivid concept artistry can bring to life scenes of a pitched battle that raged here in the late Bronze Age. Over several seasons, German archaeologists uncovered the wonderfully preserved remains of numerous individuals who had clearly met with a violent end. Mingled with human and horse bones were substantial quantities of metalwork. Large numbers of bronze arrowheads were recovered, along with sickles and spear and axe heads. More recently, a cache of scrap metal that had been carried into battle came to light. Along with another sickle, this included chisels and punches, but still no sign of a sword. So, based strictly on the evidence currently available, a sword-wielding warrior must be rearmed with a flashing bronze axe. Imagine details such as dress and hairstyle follow what has become early 21st century convention. Osteoanalysis nevertheless confirms the widespread use of metal spear and arrowheads, the devastating penetrative effect of which can be seen here. The use of flint or arrowheads is also clear with this debilitating upper arm injury. The anaerobic conditions at Tullins Valley also preserved several organic artef artefacts. A wooden club like the one seen here may have been responsible for the lethal blow to the front of this victim's head. In style it resembles remarkably resembles an Irish shillelagh, a traditional wooden cudgel in common use until the late 19th century. We know much more about medieval battles and the types of injury they produced. On a snowy Palm Sunday in 1461, over the River Cock at Totten in North Yorkshire, perhaps the bloodiest conflict on English soil left a wealth of osteological evidence for future archaeologists. Excavations at an Irish medieval cemetery in Kilroot found a skull with fatal sharp force trauma typical of that caused by a metal sword. This individual had several other healed injuries, suggesting that he was probably a professional soldier. This contrasts with the skeletal damage seen at Tollins Valley all of which could have been caused by hunting or farming implements or simple wooden clubs. The evidence points not to a well-armed warrior elite, but rather to a civilian militia of farmers and metal workers who took to the battlefield armed with whatever came to hand. In part two, 
we look at the pointy things referred to in the title. Bronze Age daggers, dirks, rapiers and axes. And consider what could be a significant misinterpretation of their use.